Um, like Carl said, we have uh, an opportunity to um, sit and have a conversation today with Dr. Galen Erickson, who is the University of Nebraska's Extension Feedlot Specialist. And him and his researchers have spent a great deal of time working in the area of um, co-product or byproduct research. And we asked him to, well, I think, who went on the tour this morning of the ethanol plant? They have um, primarily worked in the area of corn ethanol byproducts, and he'll tell you a little bit more. I won't do the justice needed to give him an introduction. But I um, twisted his arm a little bit to help us put on this presentation um, with the help of Dr. Um, Greg Lardy, who's done extensive research in, in the sugar beet um, byproduct area. So without further ado, I hope we can go ahead and get started. Galen, can you? hear us or see us or take the camera off me up here in the can you see me? Yep. Can you see me? Yep. Okay, I'm glad, I'm glad. I'm glad the green didn't tell any story. It is, uh, it is uh, nice to nice talk, talk to you, to you. <laughs> but the challenge, but the challenge is, is that I want you to go to sending us any water. water. Um, um, we uh, we uh, are experiencing flooding, flooding, but not flooding, near as dramatic as the part there in the state. state. So, uh, uh, it made travel made quite travel difficult, quite difficult and so we decided we would do it this way. I'm happy I'm to happy uh, share, with share with you those things, things we've done, done on you know, that was great, and I hope and that I you, hope uh, you uh, at least saw at the least tour today or been or that plan, because I'm going to kind of jump right into right right in feeding the stillers grains and what it's like. If you can hear me okay, Scott, maybe type me a note or something, but I will go ahead and get started. I want to recognize that there are a lot of people involved in the work that I'm going to be sharing here today. And again, I'm going to focus a little bit on using the Stillers Grains initially in the feedlot diet, as well as in the cow calf situation. Okay, and, okay, and the PowerPoint should be up, I hope, and, uh, and uh, I will go ahead. go ahead. So this is a list of what I would call uh, my product that we deal with in the cattle operation. On the top here is, is primarily uh, byproducts of, of the ethanol plant, and so they are... Uh, Distillers grains, and I'll talk about that there's traditional distillers grains, which is 65% uh, water, 35% dry matter. And then there's modified distillers grains, which is 55% uh, 50 to 55% water and uh, 45 to 50% dry matter. Then you can have dry distillers grains uh, if the plant chooses to dry it down. And then there's also a liquid that comes out of those plants called syrup or distiller solubles, sometimes called CCDS or condensed corn distiller solubles. Now, I don't want to forget about, though, that we have uh, products like corn gluten feed, uh, either in the wet or dry form, which come out of uh, plants like Cargill's plant there in, in Wapiton, which I think would be fairly close, and, uh, and you can get it from other parts. Now, if all that's not confusing enough, and there is a lot of confusion over what's distiller's grains, what is gluten feed, it's going to get more and more challenging in the future because these plants are doing uh, more and more things in their plants, such as removing oil or making other distiller's products. And so I worry a little bit that there's still confusion out there over, okay, what is distiller's grains, what is gluten feed, and they're not the same thing. And we can talk about differences, but I'm going to focus today mostly on distillers grains because that I think was the topic uh, that they wanted to discuss. Now, all plants produce wet distillers grains. Uh, plants that are not close to livestock may dry that down and produce a product that's called dry distillers grains. 
it's generally in a meal form. Uh, I hope those arrows are showing up, but but those are it's just like soybean meal and other uh, canola meal that would you, you'd probably be familiar with. Now, what many producers uh, want, of course, is they don't want to feed the meal if they want to use dry, and so they try and pellet it, or even in some cases put it into a range cube. But I just want to point out that, that that's not an easy task because it doesn't pellet or go into a cube really well. Now, we've been able to, to get it as mostly distiller's grains, but it's not a very uh, hard cube with integrity. Now, there's really two ways to use these, both in feedlots and in, in cow-calf situations. And, and I would say, in general, you include it at low levels, less than 15% of what they eat on the cow-calf side, two pounds maybe or three. And if you're doing it that way, you're using it as a protein source. And you know what? That works great. It's been done for uh, oh, roughly 100 years because we've been doing that with whiskey distillers grains forever. So that's not a real new concept, but I do want to make sure it's clear that, that using distillers grains as a protein supplement is, is very cost effective in most cases and uh, works quite well. Now, what we've been focused on here the last 10 or 15 years, though, is how can we use much, much more and uh, primarily use it as an energy source. And that could be an energy source in a cow-calf situation as well with backgrounding calves or with, uh, with cows that you may want to put uh, condition on. So point is, is that, that with all this distillers that we have, at least across the U.S., but particularly here in Nebraska, We've been focused on how much can we use, feeding much greater amounts than 15%. So the questions that we get commonly is, okay, how does this feed relative to corn? And so we went back and we wanted to summarize uh, wet distillers grains experiments we've done, which included 20 different trials. We wanted to look at modified distillers grains, which we had four experiments on. And then we wanted to look at dry distillers grains, which, again, we had four uh, trials on. And so I'm just going to give you the summary of that, and that's in this table. So if you're a feedlot producer and you're buying either wet, modified, or dry distillers grains, uh, and you're feeding it at either 10, 20, 30, or 40 percent, this is the, the value, if you will, to the cattle relative to corn. So what does that mean? That means that if you're going to buy dry distiller's grains and feed it at 30% of the diet, it is going to result in performance that's about 110, 111% the energy of corn. Now notice that if you look at wet distiller's grains, it's about 137% at 30% inclusion. And again, that's a summary of lots of different trials. The wet distiller's grain is the one we've studied the most, and uh, that's uh, 20 experiments there over the last uh, 18 years. So my point is, is that buying distiller's grains, you should expect better performance than corn. If they were all 100, that means you would expect identical performance as if you were just replacing corn or, or feeding corn. That they're all greater than 100 means that, in fact, the performance is, is better than what you would see with just feeding corn. So that's a good thing because, historically, you can purchase them considerably cheaper than corn. And that's why we see everybody in, in Nebraska particularly uh, using this and using it at fairly high levels. My guess is is that, that the inclusion level on average in Nebraska is somewhere between 30 and 40 percent. Now, I've got to point out here that that's on a dry matter basis, and that's important when you look at wet feed. It's sort of like feeding silage. If you have experience with silage, you've got to include even more on an as-fed basis to account for the because, – because that ingredient's wetter. So I want to make sure that's clear to everybody, that those inclusions in the diet – are on a dry matter basis, and we'll talk more about that later on today. Now, the other thing to notice is that the modified is sort of in between the dry and the wet, and that the dry doesn't give you as good a performance as feeding wet, and that's the case at least with feedlot cattle. 
Now, notice that none of those were compared in the same experiment. And so we thought that wet was going to give us better performance than dry, and that's been done in certain experiments. But the modified we were unsure of, and, and our data, if you just look at averaging all these different experiments, looks like it's in between. So to test that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, here, here before I get to that, here is uh, sort of the analysis uh, that gives you those data in, in pounds per day. So this is available in our, in our Nebraska beef reports, which you can have access to. Uh, but this looks at how average daily gain uh, and feed the gain change when you go from zero to 40%. And I hope that shows up okay. But for dry distiller's grains, gain will go from three, five to four pounds a day. And uh, conversions go from six, five to six, two. And that's again across all of these different studies. Wet distiller's grains, on the other hand, notice is that gain goes from three, five uh, uh, I'm sorry, I think that's a mistake. That first one here is a mistake. That's wet distiller's grains. Uh, this is modified distiller's grains, and this is dry distiller's grains down here. I apologize, there's a mistake on that slide. Point is, is that wet distiller's grains uh, uh, conversions got better, modified distiller's grains conversions get better, and dry distiller's grains conversions get better, but not as dramatic as with the wet. Now, like I mentioned, none of those had been compared in the same experiment. And so Brandon Nuttleman, a PhD student, is, is going to release this in our 2012 Nebraska Beef Report where he compared feeding wet, modified, and dry distillers grains listed across the top there in the same experiment to the same cattle. And uh, we wanted to compare performance. And I couldn't have made these data up better because if you look at the average daily gain, it is uh, uh, identical across those three types of, of feed. They all gained about four pounds a day, but the cattle fed wet distillers grains, it only took 25 pounds of feed to put on that four pounds of gain. For the cattle fed modified, it took 26.4. And for the cattle fed dry, it took 27.1. So a very typical energy response, at least for finishing cattle. And so that gives you uh, conversions that went from 6.1 to 6.7. And the modified is sort of right in between at 6.3. No effect on, on uh, carcass trait or quality grade or yield grade. And so uh, basically just tells us that, uh, that, that wet's better than dry. Now, in all cases, in this study, we did have a corn control. In all cases, the cattle fed any of the distiller's grains did better than uh, the cattle fed corn. So it's not that dry distiller's grains is not a good feed. It's that uh, the wet appears, though, to give you better energy performance than the dry. I also want to point out that this was included at either 20, 30, or 40 percent in the diet, and this is the average then of about a 30 percent inclusion. Now, there's also been a lot of questions before I sort of wrap up the feedlot stuff. There's been a lot of questions about what does feeding distillers grains do to uh, uh, carcass characteristics. And uh, ironically, a few years ago when quality grades were getting poorer, People said, well, it's because we're feeding more distiller's grains. And now this last year, year and a half, quality grades as an industry have been very good. And uh, ironically, it's because we're feeding more distiller's grains is what people say now. My point is, is that in all of our studies, this is looking at back fat thickness. As you increase the level of distiller's grains in the diet on the x-axis, fat depth gets better or they get a little fatter with same days on feed. Um, and marbling score, which is really your measure of quality grade, certainly isn't depressed. It actually gets a little better as we feed increasing levels. And then it does start to tail off some, but that's about exactly the same as what the average daily gain uh, um, graph looks like. 
I have all of these slides I, I think are available to you as well. I've, I've cut out some for the sake of time, so you'll have to kind of see uh, where those are at if you have those available to you. Okay, the other thing that we see a lot of people doing is that as we feed distillers grains, and particularly wet distillers grains, they wanted to look at what happens to how much roughage I have to feed. And so uh, uh, Josh Benton, as part of his PhD, looked at feeding no roughage, 3 to 6% roughage, or 6 to 12% roughage. And you may wonder why we have a range on those. The reason there's a range there is because we were comparing corn silage, corn stalks, and alfalfa hay. And so, for example, in this, in this normal level of roughage, that's 12% corn silage, 6% corn stalks, or 8% alfalfa hay. And the reason we use those levels is because that was equal uh, fiber in the diet from roughage. Notice that as we added roughage, intake went up in a, uh, in a linear manner. Uh, Average daily gain increased as well in a linear manner. And uh, feed to gain, that's a mistake, this is actually pounds of feed per pound to gain, was actually best for the cattle fed no roughage, which by the way is not an untypical response um, or atypical response. But notice that when we feed roughage, intake goes up, gain goes up, maybe equal or even slightly poor uh, conversion. Here's the point though, because of the extra gain and, and intake, uh, we don't recommend pulling roughage out of diets when we put in distiller's grains in place of corn, which I know is a common thought process, but uh, we just don't see that as a benefit. However, what we do see is that when you compare alfalfa hay to corn silage, to corn stalks, in other words, the lower quality uh, roughage, historically the alfalfa would, would do a little better than silage, which would be quite a bit better. Those two would be quite a bit better than corn stalks. And what we see in this case is no effect on average daily gain and no effect on fee conversion. Now this wasn't significant, but if anything, a little better profit because the corn stalks are cheaper and uh, and you can buy them uh, and you're replacing corn, generally speaking, at lower inclusions. Okay, I want to talk a little bit more about sulfur and then I'll talk about cow-calf, but before I get to the sulfur, I just wanted to touch on this. There are limitations to how much we can use and, and, and to be honest, that's what we're studying down here now is is not can we feed it at 30% and that it works well, it's can we feed it at 60% and make that work well. And so I just want to talk about what we perceive are the limitations. Eventually, fat in the diet becomes a limitation for cattle, and we've gone very high in terms of dietary fat, and we've had uh, some mixed results, but the only time we've had trouble with high fat in the diet wasn't because of distiller's grains, it was because of a different source of fat besides distiller's grains. So I don't see fat being a major limitation, in my opinion, based on our data. Sulfur is a limitation, and I want to talk about that. Uh, protein and phosphorus and the fiber that come with distiller's grains are, are not much of an issue. Now, I did not discuss the process, but because I, I, I was hoping you were on the plant tour and, and they uh, would have gone through this. But essentially, you take grain and you remove the starch out of the grain to make ethanol. So all the things left in corn or in the grain that you use can be other grains, but let's just say it's corn. Uh, all the things left in corn besides starch are increased three times. And the reason they're increased three times is because there's about two-thirds starch in the corn. So if you take two-thirds away, um, all the other things left besides starch, such as protein, uh, fiber, phosphorus, uh, fat, are all increased threefold. So example is if corn is 4% oil or fat, uh, distiller's grain should be um, 12 percent fat. If protein is 10 percent protein in, in corn, 
distillers grain should be 30. So I just want to point that out. But those, the, the protein and the phosphorus and the fiber are not really issues in terms of limiting how much is good for performance. They are certainly more challenging from an, an environmental perspective, which is important to us, but uh, it won't hurt the cattle per se. So why are producing, producers feeding more and more is because, generally speaking, it's worth more than corn, and they're buying it cheaper than corn, and, uh, and that's why they want to feed as much as possible. I just want to end, though, on this with one comment that our data suggests that there's really not a lot of incentive to going above 40% uh, economically just doesn't seem to pay. 40% inclusion is a good inclusion uh, unless corn goes much greater than, than uh, the price it is today, we don't see a large, a large incentive to go at more than 40% inclusion in feedlot diets. That might be the same, by the way, in, in, in growing diets as well. Okay, before I touch on sulfur, I, I, we got to discuss what is distiller's grain. And that the plants that you buy from are the plants you need to find out what they produce. But we want to know just in general what is distiller's grains like. So we worked with six Nebraska ethanol plants. We sampled those plants, 10 semi-loads a day for five days in a row, and we did that for, for four different months. And our distiller's grains was 31% protein across the state, 12% fat, 0.8% phosphorus, and about 0.8% sulfur. And the last thing I want to point out before we talk about sulfur is the fat provides a lot of energy, and there's a lot of discussion on removing some of that fat. Um, and so you really need to find out if the plant is removing fat or not. And then a lot of people use DDGs. They say DDGs, and I think they think the S is the plural. That's not the case. The S stands for the solubles, which is important component to add back to the grain. I hope that was discussed in the tour that you had. Okay, why is sulfur important? Well, uh, there's pockets, especially in the Dakotas. I'm assuming that that's the case in parts of North Dakota where the water can be high in sulfur. And that may limit how much you can feed of these products because they're 0.8% sulfur. And we can talk about why that's the case, but they're also variable. Well, the NRC says that cattle can tolerate a maximum of 0.4% sulfur. And then in a newer book on mineral tolerances, they actually say 0.3% sulfur in grain-based diet. We didn't believe that was right because we fed a lot of cattle more sulfur than that. So we went back and we looked at uh, 17,000 head of cattle that we finished in our, in our university research feedlot over, over eight year period. And uh, here's the problem with sulfur, if you're not familiar with it. If cattle get too much sulfur, um, it can cause a disease called sulfur-induced polio uh, encephalomalacia. Now that's a mouthful, and uh, so no one calls it uh, that. They call them either polios, or even a better term I like is brainers. Uh, and they call them that because it's a central nervous system um, problem where the cattle actually are uncoordinated and, um, and can fall down can lead to death if goes uh, untreated. We just completed this analysis and uh, it's being released now in our new beef report and, and in different uh, venues. Okay, so here's what we observed. If you look at dietary sulfur, and this is in distiller's grains diet, and a no fiber diet or no roughage, excuse me, a normal roughage diet, which is in blue, or a higher 2x normal, if you will, uh, roughage diet, what happens is, is that as you feed more sulfur, polio incidence gradually increases at some point. And uh, that's really the key, is what point does the polios increase? You'll notice that with no roughage in the diet, that point is back here around 0.4. With normal levels of roughage, we estimate that it's around 0.5. Uh, if you have higher levels of roughage, it seems to help uh, reduce the incidence of polio. Now, this might be for, for Karina and Carl and Greg and some of those more, more interested in the, in the nutrition, uh, 
But looking at total dietary sulfur is also not a good idea. We think it's better to look at it the same way we look at protein and look at it as degradable sulfur. Frankly, for producers, that's probably not a big deal, but this is looking at rumen degradable sulfur here on the, on the x-axis, and the same trend occurs. Point is, is somewhere between 0.4 and 0.5% sulfur is where we've got to really be watching dietary sulfur. And again, I'll remind you that if your water is high in sulfur, uh, that, can, that, that just exasperates this problem. You have to account for uh, how much is in, uh, how much sulfur is in your water. This is the graph of the first month that we were out sampling those plants. So sample zero to 50 is one plant. Notice that this plant varied from 0.4 0.45 to as high as 1.7% sulfur. So it had the lowest and, and easily by far the highest. Notice that this plant, which goes from here to here, ran higher than all the rest, but was fairly consistent around 1 to 1.2. This is what we have to deal with, is that if you're buying from this plant versus this plant, you have to know, and especially if you happen to be the producer that gets that load. So that's why we are interested in sulfur. Now, we did this the first month, and then we went out and talked with the plants, and this is what it looked like the last month. So I'd like to take all the credit for the improvement that these, uh, these plants made, but they, they basically uh, paid more attention, and now it's all running 0.7, and you know what? We can deal with this. We know how to deal with this and how much we can feed if it's always going to be excuse me, if it's always going to be 0.7. Now, before polio happened, we also wanted to look at uh, Kansas State did a very nice experiment looking at levels of sulfur in distiller's grains, and we looked at feeding either a low sulfur or a high sulfur, what we thought were in any way low and high sulfur distiller's grains, and what that does to performance. And what we saw is that, that this line right here, the solid lines are the high sulfur distiller's grain. We fed it either wet or dry, and we fed it at either 20, 30, or 40% inclusion. And notice that as you fed higher inclusions of the high sulfur distiller's grain, intake dropped compared to the low sulfur. How much they gained, which it shows up here as hot carcass weight, drops off as sulfur gets either either high sulfur distiller's grains and it has to be fed at high inclusions, intake dropped off, gains and carcass weights dropped off. Interestingly, there was really no effect on feed conversion. These two lines here are the wet, these two lines here are the dry. So in general, feeding more sulfur, even if it doesn't cause polio, generally will reduce intakes and reduce gain, probably with little to no impact on feed conversion. And I know there's been work on sulfur in the Dakotas as well, and that data is very similar, that cattle tend to eat less, gain less, and not a big impact on, on feed conversion. Okay, so to wrap up the feedlot part, um, uh, wetter's better, and distillers have been very economical. We've got a Think about how much we got to feed, especially as grain gets more expensive. Okay, so a few things then on the cow-calf side, uh, experiences that we've had here at Nebraska and, and things to think about. Uh, you know, we've looked at feeding it to cows on a limit feeding basis. We've looked at winter supplementation and the impact on reproduction. We've looked at feeding different forms of it, meaning the dry, the wet, the pellets, the, et cetera. We've looked at replacing low quality forages primarily, and then we've looked at winter and summer programs, and we're currently looking at what happens if you supplement this at higher levels, will they replace uh, some of the forage? Uh, I'm sure this isn't the case in, the, in North Dakota, but forages are fairly, pastures getting more and more expensive here, and so we're very interested in ways to reduce the, the needs for forages in the pasture as well. Very similar to what we did in the feedlot side, uh, Will Griffin summarized, I think it was 18 experiments looking at feeding more 
and more distiller's grains. This is in pounds per head per day supplement on cattle-fed forage-based diets in dry lots or on pasture. And, and, and the point of these two lines is that they're a little bit different, but both lines increase. If, if you have cattle fed a forage-based diet, in this case, they were gaining 1.2 to 1.5. As you add distiller's grains to the diet, uh, you will see fairly dramatic increases in average daily gain. We've looked at it. We use a lot of corn stalk residue for grazing. Uh, this would, be, I presume, be very similar to native range response on, on, uh, in the wintertime. Uh, nice response in terms of gain on stock grazing as well. Uh, out west at our Goodmanson Ranch in the Sand Hills, Dr. Lardy uh, is very familiar with this ranch, did a lot of research there in the past. Uh, we've looked at supplementing uh, in bunks or on the ground and what the impact of that is. We've looked at supplementing dry distillers, and in this case, this was wet distillers on the ground. Uh, Aaron Stalker took this picture, uh, who's at North Platte, and he took it on a day when we had snow cover so you could see it, because after they eat it, you don't get to see any of it. And, and so one of the questions he had is, well, is it okay to supplement on the ground or not? Before I do that, he also, in that study, looked at three days a week versus six days a week, and this is with cows, over uh, over the winter time from December 1st to uh, to March 1st and supplementing as a protein source more or less at about a pound per cow per day and uh, basically if you supplemented three days versus six days a week no difference in body weight uh, and no difference in body condition score however if you looked at whether we put that supplement in a bunk or if they were supplementing on the ground he was surprised that actually the bunk supplemented, cow supplemented in bunks, actually had less body weight loss and, uh, if anything, uh, a difference, but if anything, a slight increase in body condition score compared to supplementing on the ground, which suggests that they're not getting all that distiller's grains picked up. Same idea with calves, growing calves in the winter. They were pretty light. Weaned calves, weaned at about 400 pounds, supplemented over the winter, in this case a little over two pounds a day from October to December. And uh, here again, the calves supplemented on the bunks, in the bunks, uh, gained more weight than calves supplemented on the ground, suggesting that they're not picking it all up. So I'll let him discuss that with you if you ever have questions, but I think their, their arguments are is that uh, bunks are best if you can do it. Uh, there's some advantages, I know, of supplementing on the ground, but something for you to think about. Um, oh, this is another study, uh, the second year, sorry, that was looking at 440-pound calves, supplemented two pounds a day. In this case, it was from March to May, and I think this might have been on meadows as well, which is different than the upland range but again, saw the very same difference, if you will, between supplementing in the bunk versus supplementing on ground. Now, the last question I think I have on, on this issue for forage fed cattle is for backgrounding calves, and I know my time's about up, but this is the, the probably the best summary of what we have looking at energy value of distiller's grains, and it's relative to corn so this is expressed as a percentage of corn again, but it's in forage-based diet. And you just see there that there's uh, uh, five studies, uh, excuse me, four studies, and the values uh, varied from 114 to 150%. And I know that's not great to have that much variation, and that's why I wanted to show you uh, all the different numbers that we've observed over the last few years in forage-based experiments. So here are the issues I see anyway. This is my opinion on, on the stiller's grains in forage-based diets. We do not see a very big difference between the wet and dry distiller's grains in forage-based diets, which is kind of puzzling. It's an excellent protein source. There's no doubt about that. Again, that's been done for 100 years. Uh, it does work well in forage-based diets because you don't have the starch that normally comes from supplementing corn or grain energy to 
to cattle and forage-based diets. The sulfur concern is less with forage-based diets or with cows. Uh, it's, not, it's not completely eliminated, but it's just less of a concern. To me, uh, the, the challenge with cows is that if you want to feed a lot of distiller's grain, the challenge is, is getting a poor enough quality forage. Maybe that won't be a challenge this year, but normally, I think, to be honest, you've got to find as low a quality of forage to mix with the distillers. Uh, that's a challenge on the cow side. Otherwise, the cows just gain weight and, and more weight than you may want. The biggest difference, though, is that in the forage side, you've got to think about, do I want to have wet or dry? How do I want to handle that? If I'm going to bring in wet, how do I store it? And then how am I going to get it out there to those cows or those calves in extensive forage systems? Those are the challenges to me. Of course, it's always a challenge to make sure you get them economically. I'll, I'll be with you here all day, but I wanted to bring this up now as, as I've shared our, our best estimates of what we think feeding these distillers grains and byproducts in feedlot diets and in forage-based situations, what, we, what our data say, and, and we've provided that to you. Uh, I certainly, all of our data is also available on our beef website, just like what North Dakota State would do. And uh, I just got to recognize our Nebraska Corn Board because they fund a lot of our research on this issue. So, Karina um, and Carl, I would uh, turn it back to you guys. And, and I don't know if people are still awake because I can't see you, but I hope this has worked okay and, and uh, be open to any questions. I know I've taken at least my 30 minutes, so maybe there isn't time, but. Everybody's still there. Yeah, hold on one second. How does it affect birth weight uh, distillers if you fed two pregnant cows? Did you hear that question, uh, Dylan? Uh, I, I could. I, my volume was turned down on purpose. Could you repeat that for me quick? What have you seen as far as the birth weight on calves when feeding two pregnant cows? Uh, that's a good question. Um, Rick Funston's done a lot of work in, uh, we've looked at a systems approach to where supplementing the cows in the wintertime, what was the impact on that calf's birth weight, weaning weight, uh, uh, frankly, feedlot performance, et cetera. And um, I don't remember all of the data. I have seen it all, um, and I could look it up for you quickly. But birth weight, I know there was very little impact of supplementing the cow distiller's grain on subsequent birth weight of that calf if she was supplemented while the calf was in utero. Now, there is impacts on the calf later in life, and uh, that's why I mentioned Rick Funston, who's out at North Platte at our research station there, he and I know there's a lot of reproduction physiologists who are, are interested in this, but he's very excited about what we do to the cow and the long-term impacts or carryover effects on those calves, you know, the fetal programming concept. And distillers does have some positive benefits on that calf's lifetime production, but doesn't seem to influence birth weight as far as I recall the data. Have you done any research using uh, distiller solubles? Uh, yes, I knew I was going to be long on my talk, so I purposely uh, left that out. Um, we've looked at feeding solubles, the, the syrup, those are used interchangeably, on both forage situations and in the feedlot. And I don't know which one you might have wanted to know more about. Um, basically, uh, and I, I'm, I'm a feedlot-focused person, so I'm, I'm more familiar with that feedlot work. Um, on the forage side, we're starting to study it more and more, and the solubles work well. We've looked at storing solubles by mixing it with hay and supplementing it to cattle. We've looked at supplementing solubles to growing calves. And to be honest, we're into breeding heifers, um, 
uh, first calf heifers, you know, uh, basically backgrounding heifers. And to be honest, the solubles don't give us quite the same performance as supplementing distiller's grain, but clearly it's much better than forage. Um, so the thing we're trying to look at is, is that because it's limited in the kind of protein that it has, or is it too much fat? Because the solubles are quite high in fat, and the fat becomes a limitation in a forage-based diet. I should have pointed that out. I said fat was not a concern in feedlot diets, in my opinion. It is a concern in forage-based diets, and, and, and Greg and Carl and them there can discuss that more better than I can even. On the feedlot side, we've looked at feeding it. Uh, Alan Trenkel, who is at Iowa State, has probably done as much in the past on feeding solubles as anybody. He had fed it at 0 to 15%, and to be honest, always saw nice performances, performance responses to feeding solubles. This last year, we've looked at two studies we've done, and uh, we've fed it from 0 to 36% in the diet, in a corn-based diet alone, as the only byproduct, and the best level was 27%, and that's on a dry basis. We went back and just completed a study, though, because no one's going to just be feeding solubles, in our state anyway. They're going to feed distiller's grains at a certain level and then want to feed more solubles on top of it. And so what we've done is we've looked at feeding 20% uh, wet distiller's grain and then adding solubles on top of it. And we did that up to another 21%. And the best level was, was 20% distiller's, 14% uh, solubles. That was a long answer. I hope that addressed it. All of that information, again, all of our research is available uh, to you. And uh, Carl and, and Karina and them know how to get a, get access to that. Much of this, though, that I just mentioned will not be out until December in our 2012 Nebraska Beef Report. At what level protein will affect consumption? Excuse me, not consumption, conception. Uh, this is that's an excellent question. Um, again, I'm I'm a feedlot person, so I hope that we don't have to deal with any conceptions in the feedlot. But uh, Rick Funston, again, I keep discussing him. He he would be a good person to consult on this. He's not seen any concerns on conception at the supplement levels that we've been feeding, and he's compared feeding anywhere from none up to uh, uh, roughly five pounds of dry matter of, of distiller supplementation. And we thought, I, excuse me, I know we thought that, that he thought that early on that that excess protein would hurt conception. And that was based on quite a bit of work out of, uh, I think the Southwest, New Mexico, uh, that, that excess protein hurts conception. We've not seen that here with distiller's grains, feeding it at moderate levels. To be frank, there's no reason why you would be feeding five, per, five pounds per head per day for protein. In that case, you'd be feeding it for protein and energy. But regardless, he did not see any real negative impacts on conception. Again, uh, Carl and Greg and, and Rick Funston and them might be able to address your question better than me. But I know protein has been a concern in the past on conception. It doesn't appear to be a concern with this source of protein. I should I should make clear that, that that's up to that five pounds inclusion of dry matter per day. If you go real high, I don't know what the impact would be. <laughs> 